gracious, loving Heavenly Father, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for the opportunity that you have given us to come together, to feast together upon your word. We long to grow in grace and knowledge of you. I ask that you'd seal to our hearts only that which is truth, filtering out all of the foolishness, all of the ignorance. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We've been studying together in 1 Corinthians verse by verse. And in our last study together, we had reached the 21st verse of chapter 14. This is God's Word. We're not looking at the Apostle Paul's ideas about tongues. We're not looking at the Apostle Paul's ideas about women speaking in the church. I pointed out that the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians is the primary chapter on speaking in tongues in the entire New Testament. We've seen in our study that tongues are childish and immature, that they're a sign for unbelievers, not for believers. We were told that tongues ceased on their own, by themselves. We're also told in chapter 13 that when we be became a man, we put away childish things. So tongues shall cease when we mature. There won't be any use for them. And then we reached verse 21. In the law it is written, With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people. And yet for all that will they not hear me, saith the Lord. Verse 22, Wherefore tongues are for a sign not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. And again, the word prophesying there means proclaiming. <clears throat> now it can... Uh, Proclaim the truth of the Word of God, and I believe in this context, it is proclaiming God's truth. But proclaiming truth is not for them that believe not. It's not for unbelievers. But for them that believe. And I believe that's why we're here. I believe that's why we're still here. You know, and there's a lot of entertainment, which is called church, and, they, and it's called worship. But it seems to me that worship is studying together the Word of the Sovereign God. Proclaiming truth. That's what prophesying is. It can either be proclaiming the truth about the future, or it be proclaiming a truth that God wants Proclaimed any truth that God wants pro proclaimed. Now we've already been told by the Holy Spirit that Paul was chosen by God and ordained by God to complete the Word of God. So we, we have the complete Word of God and it can be proclaimed. And it, Christians should want to know the truth of the Word of God. You may hear truth taught here on this channel, folks. It, or you may not. It is, it is my constant prayer every day that that be true. I'm dead certain there are thousands of other Bible teachers who feel exactly the same way. So I urge you, especially now, at this given time, to prayerfully seek the Word of God for the truth that He would have you know. Your job is to search the Scriptures every day to see whether or not these things be so. 
you know, not not very interesting to study tongues and uh, you know, and particularly women speaking in the church. Be a, be a whole lot more fun to be talking about prophecy and and I think you know, you know, a lot more fun, a lot more interesting if we could discuss more interesting topics. But I want you to realize that by the sovereign power of God, we have gathered together to look at these verses of Scripture. They're not uninteresting. They're not boring. Uh, they're, they're God's Word. And since it's God's Word, it seems to me that we ought to be compelled, overwhelmed with a desire to know what He wants us to know. Verse 23, If therefore the whole church be come together into one place and all speak with tongues and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that ye are mad? Mad. The Holy Spirit says if, if all of the church came together in one place, well, you know, the indication is the, they don't normally do that. It seems evident there's probably more than one group of people meeting in Corinth who are uh, believers in Jesus Christ. And they, they constitute uh, a church. If all of them, however, came together in one place and they all spoke with tongues... And there comes in an unlearned or an unbeliever. Won't they say you're mad? Well, of course they would. They don't understand anything. You know, they would say that you're mad. Clearly, verse 23 says, if you're interested in speaking in tongues, you can't communicate with one of God's children who is an unbeliever. Now, I may shock people, you know, because you see, the minute that we use the word unbeliever, we think of, well, you know, we think of Satan's children. You know, there, there's believers, they're going to heaven, and there are unbelievers, and they're going to hell. And folks, I don't believe that you can support that from Scripture. In fact, if, if you look at the context here, if you proclaim to them the Word of God, they would fall down on their face and worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. But... Many don't do that, okay? Not all believers are mature believers when it comes to the truth of God's Word. I wouldn't be surprised if a great number of people who wind up in heaven get there knowing very little, if, if, if anything, about the Word of God. You know, we're so convinced that, that man is redeemed by something that he did that we even translate Scripture that way. You know, a good example would be Galatians 2.20. You know, you, you can read a verse different than someone else can, can read it. Is it the life that I now live in the flesh, that I, I live by my faith in Jesus Christ? Or, or is it the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. The, the translators of the King James Version apparently concluded that faith is a verbal noun and therefore they have the option of, of translating the genitive objective or subjective and, in, you know, and they translated it subjective. Faith of the Son of God. But there's other good translations, good translators, good and godly men who translated other versions that translated faith in Christ Jesus. So which one's right? 
You know, they're both translators. They both love the Lord. I doubt any one of them would want to teach error. I doubt any one of them would want to translate error. But the translator is influenced, always influenced, just like everyone else, by his own theological convictions. If all speak with tongues, and there come in those that are unlearned or unbelievers, will they not say that you're mad? The word there in the Greek, it's uh, manami. It's the root of the English terms maniac and mania. You know, to rave, full of inner rage, fury. You know, or as my grandma would say, uh, used to say, you act as though you've gone plumb out of your senses. Okay, except you're mad, you're angry. It carries the word, the the connotation there is well, you're temporarily deranged. All right, a good example would be John chapter 10, where that uh, a division occurred among the Jews because of uh, words that were spoken and. And many of them uh, were, were saying that this, this person had a demon and he's insane. Um, main am I, same word, you know. Why do you listen to him? You know, same word. People just think that you've plumb gone, you just gone plumb Looney Tunes. All right. You know, it'd, it'd be sort of like you telling me, you know, uh, uh, Steve, I saw a flying saucer land and Bigfoot stepped out of it wearing a pink dress and high heel shoes. You know, and, uh, and he was speaking in Swahili. You know, I mean, but if on the other hand, if you're prophesying, that is proclaiming God's truth, and that's that's the fellowship that I'd like to worship in. You know, not foolishly talking in tongues. You know, but but you're actually proclaiming God's truth. If we're doing that. And one comes in who doesn't believe, or he's unlearned. That doesn't mean he's a non-believer. He's not redeemed. Many Christians aren't learned. Okay. He's convinced of all. He's judged of all. The Lord declared in chapter ten, "My sheep hear my voice." Okay. We have not been asked to proclaim our opinions. Okay, I don't want to proclaim my opinions. Then are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God. And is it not true that, that we worship him in spirit and in truth? And so he reports that God is in you of a truth. And I'm telling you, I think that's what this verse says. I'm absolutely fully persuaded that no man has a corner on truth and, and that I can teach error just like anyone else. But what does comfort me is the conviction that the Holy Spirit only operates in the area of truth. And I trust Him for that. It is not a foolish prayer folks, that the Holy Spirit take charge and filter out foolishness and seal to each of our hearts the truth that He wants us to know. This believer here in our text is convinced of all, he's judged of all, and the secrets of his heart are made manifest. Falling down on his face, he'll worship God and he'll report that God is in you of a truth. A lot of fancy words there, but just think of how simple that really is. My sheep hear my voice. The way that God is elected, I believe, for His sheep to hear His voice is by the proclamation of biblical truth. You know, and I, I know anybody you know here can argue, well, God, you know, God can do anything He wants. He can preach the gospel to you in a dream. You know, I figure my horse could pre preach the gospel. My horse could preach the gospel to me if God wanted him to. You know, and God may do that. I, I don't know whether He does or not. I doubt it because what I believe, folks, is it is His intent and His purpose 
to reveal His truth in His Word. We are presently living within a period that you, you could rightly call, and some have, have called, the silence of God. God doesn't speak, and this is hard for Christians to wrap their mind around, God doesn't speak any more from heaven. In actual fact, He does speak, but He speaks through His Word. There was a time when He spoke directly to men, but He hasn't done that since the completion of His Word. That which is perfect has come. I think we're living in a period of, of time when God doesn't speak to you from heaven. And the verse that interests me is He declares that when He does speak again, the earth is going to tremble and everybody's going to know it. So proclaiming the truth of the Word of God will cause that unbeliever or that unlearned child of God to fall down on his face and worship God. Tongues will never do that. Tongues, dearly beloved, tongues are no, of no benefit to a believer and they're no good for an unbeliever. That's what we've seen in, in the text. How is it, brethren, verse 26, when you come together, every one of you has a psalm, a, a tongue, a revelation, an interpretation. Let all things, all things be done unto edifying. You know, like spokes of a wheel, you know, whose central hub is the, the truth of God's Word. So it's only reasonable that we would be looking at certain constraints here in a church service. There has to be order. There has to be discipline. I think the text is clearly, clearly telling us that when we come together, there are those who would like to speak. And what is the control that all things be done unto edifying? And that takes some judgment. Anything done in relation to this fellowship should be done to build up the church. But I am not the source of all truth. This book is. And you folks ought to leave this message, every message, encouraged, comforted, built up, not convicted, not discouraged, not put under great pressure, you know, of any sort, you know, as much as we sin, it's, it's sometimes hard to comprehend that we are, in fact, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in God's sight. Oh, I mean, how could that possibly be true of me? Maybe true of the other guy, not me. You know, how in the world could God love anyone who sins as much as I do or as much as you do? Uh, we're His children. He loves us. It's, it's very easy to think that he, he couldn't possibly love me, you know, but, but he says he does. He doesn't say he did love you. He says he does love you. An everlasting, never-changing love. And to question that love is to question God. To, to question the forgiveness of your sin is to question God. You know, we're gathered together in whatever format, you know, to worship God. You know, and if, if someone has uh, something to say that edifies, that builds up the church, you ought to be allowed to say it. You know, but that's also a two-sided coin. I mean, you know, try going to church sometime and just... And just, just stand up and just try saying anything that you want to say and see what happens. You know, it may not, may not go over very well.
I've always enjoyed the comments, the positive comments that y'all leave here, but if it's not edifying, you probably won't make it on the comment thread. You know, occasionally we have to be careful to make sure it's edifying. You know, what is edifying? Well, it's building up the church. So if any man speaks in a tongue, let it be only two, or at the most three, no more than three. Seems like the Holy Spirit is really emphasizing two here. And that's not popular, folks, in most tongue services today. You know, at the most three. And, 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 and in turn, you know, take turns. Don't yell at each other. Don't do it at the same time. Has to be one at a time. And there has to be one that interprets. You got to have an interpreter. One must interpret it. It's a present imperative mood. It's a command. Okay? If there isn't a, an interpreter there, no tongue. So one could, you know, then, not now, speak in an unknown tongue in a church, but three at the most, in succession, in order, not at the same time, and there has to be an interpreter, and that interpretation must build up the church or he's not allowed to speak. So it's, it's that simple. And that, that seems rather orderly. At least it does to me. If there, if there be no interpreter, let the one who wants to speak in tongues keep silent in the church. So, one who wants to speak in tongues has to identify an interpreter. And it's good if it isn't himself. You know, I mean, I mean if he's the interpreter, you know, he can make it say anything he wants. You know, the, the inference clearly is there is another interpreter. If there's not an interpreter present, that means there has to be somebody there that knows what that person is saying and will interpret it. And if that's not true, then they don't speak at all. That's the command. If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence. So if you're going to speak in Swahili, you know, or whatever, and you don't understand what the language means, if there isn't anybody there, you know, who understands it and interprets it, you can't speak. And that's, that's true in the case of any language interpreter. You know, uh, anybody that uh, professes to be speaking in a tongue, whatever it is, there has to be an interpreter. And this is heavily emphasized in the text. I believe the word unlearned means he doesn't know the language that's being spoken, and he doesn't believe God, or he doesn't believe the gospel, or, or whatever word you, you, know, you want to take. He's what we call an unbeliever, okay? And, and, and we know that only his sheep can hear and believe. In this context, if he doesn't understand the language, the unlearned doesn't mean he's, it doesn't mean he's dumb, doesn't mean he's stupid. What it means is he doesn't know the language that's being spoken. We need somebody, we've got to have somebody to interpret. And if there be no interpreter, let him keep his mouth shut. Let him keep silence in the church. You know, he can speak to himself and to God, but let the prophet speak two or three, and then others judge. And that's an imperative. That's a command. It's in the imperative mood. If the prophets... And I'm, you know, those who are going to proclaim God's word. If it isn't God's word, then others ought to judge that. There ought to be, there ought to be someone around, someone present to judge that. And they're just not free to speak anything that they want.
So that prophecy on its face is always going to be edifying. It can be nothing but edifying. If, if prophecy is a proclaiming of the Word of God, it has to edify. And, and so God is speaking through these people when they proclaim the truth, the truth of His Word. Verse 30. If anything be revealed to another that sitteth by, let the first hold his peace, but, but that anything has to be judged as to whether or not it is building up the church. There ought to, there ought to be enough people, folks, to judge whether or not what's being proclaimed is truth. You know, and, and if someone gets up and proclaims something something that's not true, something that is just flat out not true, I think that should be pointed out. If they join into worship in verse 25, that's, that's uh, well, that's evidence that what they're proclaiming is, is the truth, if they join in with the worship. If anything is revealed to another that sits by, let the first hold his peace, for you may all proclaim God's truth one by one, that all may learn and all may be comforted. Learn and be comforted. That's what the truth of God's Word does. That all may learn and all may be comforted. God's Word comforts. It doesn't convict. It doesn't condemn. We've already been convicted. We've already been forgiven. We're new creations in Christ Jesus. God's Word comforts. Learn means to be edified. Comforted means, well, to be comforted. No matter what happens, you're going to heaven. The God that we worship works all things together for our good and for His glory. That's what this book says. You're forever secure in Christ. The one speaking in tongues is the one that has to have somebody to interpret. The one proclaiming does not need an interpreter. Okay? <laughs> Doesn't need an interpreter. But the one speaking in tongues does. You know, I always feel it's important to point out again, repeatedly, over and over, probably till you're tired of hearing it, that this is God's Word. These are not the rambling ideas of an old man named Paul who didn't like women, who was a bigot, or, you know, whatever, who didn't like women and had certain ideas about how things ought to be done. You know, folks, this is God's Word. It's the Word of the eternal, sovereign God. And you ought to feel privileged to even hold it in your hand. And it's a message that is not only addressed to those at Corinth, but it has application for us as well. So God likens tongues to that of being childish or, or tongues to that of being immature and they pass by themselves. They cease by themselves because when we become mature, they simply pass away. Isn't that the way? And isn't it like that in real life with a child? I mean, it just simply passes away. And that's typical of all childish attachments. As we grow older, we don't have to make a, a command performance to get rid of them, okay? I mean, you know, it didn't take a lot of effort for me to get rid of my childhood toys, okay? They just passed away by themselves. When a man becomes mature, he puts away childish things we're seeing that tongues do not edify. They do not exhort. They do not comfort. You know, speaking in a language we hadn't known before. And if there's no interpretation, there's no edification. There's no exaltation. There's no rejoicing. There's no comfort. Clearly, the chapter has, has several times 
emphasize the fact that it is better to proclaim truth than it is to speak in tongues. And if one does speak in tongues, he should pray, earnestly pray that he's able to interpret. And in fact, the chapter goes on to make it absolutely clear that there ought to be no speaking in tongues unless an interpreter is present. So, when one speaks in this foreign language, there should be someone there who can interpret what is said. The Holy Spirit had Paul say that he'd rather speak five words with his understanding than he would 10,000 words in an unknown language. We were told that tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers. And yet, modern tongues are supposed to be a sign for believers. If tongue speaking occurs in a meeting, we're told, well, we're told it should, should be by it should be by two only or at the most three, no more than that. No more than three people should speak in tongues in any one meeting of the church. And it should be done in order, without confusion, you know, in sequence, taking turns. Verse 32, and the spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. That's, that is an important verse. Well, not that any other verses are less important. It isn't that something controls the one speaking. It's that he controls that spirit. He has control of it. It doesn't have control of him. You know, he's not slain by the spirit or, or something like that. The spirit of God has control of what he says. And that's necessary. That's necessary in verse 33 because our god is not the author of confusion he is in fact the the author of peace in all the churches of his saints you know in random speaking in tongues is confusion and god's not the author of confusion but of peace as in all churches of the saints in fact we were told earlier in the chapter here that if if any if someone came in that was unlearned and heard everybody speaking in an unknown language you'd say that you were gone off your rocker and now in verse 34 the subject seems to change let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. Not a popular verse, especially among you women. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. C clearly in context, dearly beloved. One meaning of this verse should be that no women should speak in tongues. I mean, that's clearly an approach that, that's been made by many people. And it, may, it might be the right one. I don't know. I don't, I don't have a whole lot of problem with that. Uh, the, I'm always talking, preaching about con the importance of context. The whole context up to verse 34 has been speaking in tongues. And now all of a sudden, as though we're, you know, we're cutting that off and changing the whole subject. Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it's not permitted unto them to speak. Or it could be, it could be that women should not speak in the church at all, which I think is the primary meaning of, meaning of the verse. Although if you want to take it as speaking in tongues, It'd really be pretty tough, I think, to argue against that 
because of the context. So uh, it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under subjection, as also saith the law. Now the word keep silent there means not to utter a sound. They're commanded to be under obedience. The word speak there, because uh, there's several different words for talk and speak and so on and so forth. The word speak there means to, means to talk. It's a Greek word that expresses the action of speaking. It has nothing to do with what's being said. So, so to say that it's a word that means speaking gossip, as some have suggested, I think is, is, is putting the word a little bit outside of its basic meaning. Because its basic meaning is just the act of talking and it, and it carries with it no idea of what's being said. But we have a word, lego, and we have that same word here also. Uh, that word lego is a word that means to talk and it's stressing what is being said and that seems to be the meaning in this verse because of, of well, because of, of the word silence. If we look at the Greek words, I think it's, it literally it states, let your women not talk in the church for it's not per permitted to them to talk. That would be a very literal rendering of the words. And that's uh, apparently beyond the context of speaking in tongues. I, uh, I believe the only two possible meanings are that women should not speak in tongues, which would ruin, well, I basically, you know, ruins the, the whole tongues movement today. Or that women shouldn't speak in the church because they are commanded to be under obedience as the law says okay that's that's not saying that the woman is now now under the law she's well she was under grace you know she's not under grace she's under law it's not saying that she's under back under the law of the the, the whole old testament law or some idea of, of law in the new testament she's not under law Okay, she's under grace. So one of the possibilities is that this is speaking of a woman who is told in the New Testament to be in subjection to her husband, which is what we see. Why? Why? Well, if we go back to Genesis chapter 3, I think it's because Satan tempted Eve to disobey God, and I think God explains that much. Adam communed directly with God. He comes home. He finds out his wife has, has disobeyed God, so, so she's going to die. What is he going to do? You know, he, he don't want to get rid of her. He wants to stay with her. So he's going to die too. Hmm. Isn't, that, isn't that interesting? Sort of a you know heroic thing, I guess. It shows how much he... The first Adam loved Eve, being willing to die for her, a parallel of what we see in the second Adam, or what I prefer to call the last Adam. There's not going to be a third. You know, Christ Jesus dying in our place. Adam didn't want to live apart from Eve. Christ didn't want to live apart from us. I think Adam recognized immediately that the one he loved had disobeyed and, and that he was going to die with her. All right. But we've been crucified with Christ. You know, she's a beautiful picture of Christ who was willing to be made sin for me that I might be made the righteousness of God in Him. You know, one of, uh, one of the things that God said in the curse 
is that her desire would be toward her husband. And of course, the popular approach to that in Genesis 3 is that, well, well what that's saying is that she has a serious, strong, serious sexual attraction, drive toward her husband, sexual or, or whatever desire for her husband, you know. Some wives do, some wives don't. A lot of wives don't. Uh, uh, I think we should, uh, uh, I don't read it that way, folks. You know, there's a lot of unhappy marriages among Christians. I don't think that desire is, is, is back in, that, in general, I don't, I don't think that is talking about sex, okay? All right, the desire of the woman will be to her husband. That word desire is her propension to control him. Now I'm sure that every one of you wives out there has no idea what that means because you've never tried to control your husband. All right, that was a joke. But I tell you, it's the cause of many a divorce, and it's the result of the curse. I do know down through the years, in, in many and in many of a case that I've dealt with personally, in problems between husbands and wives, a lot of the root cause is the woman's attempt at control, which alienates the husband, and it begins to affect the union. She's commanded to be under obedience. I believe the, the essence of that expression in this verse is the curse. You know, you're going to have a desire to control your husband, but he's to be over you. Not very popular nowadays. But that's the way God ordained it, folks. I didn't ordain it. I didn't say that. I didn't believe God. Uh, you know... God is saying that the, the woman ought to not talk. The word keep silence there is not talk. It's not permitted for her to talk. Now that could mean tongues. I, and I absolutely agree with that. However, I have other passages of Scripture. You know, I can go to, I can go to Timothy. The woman is not permitted to teach or, or exercise authority over the man. So I think the word talk means what it means. It means just what it means, just talk. But I think the essence of that, that meaning is that she's not to teach men. Men are to teach her. She may not have a husband at home. So men are to teach her. Now it says in verse 35, and if they will learn anything, okay, so it's not limited to tongues, let them ask their husbands at home, for it's a shame for women to speak in the church. The woman should not talk in the church. And it's churches plural. For it's a shame for a woman to speak in the church. And verse 36, so, uh, and I, as usual, I'm, I usually go by the authorized version. What? Question mark. Came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? Okay. I think that's saying you're not the only one speaking the word of God, nor are you the only one that received it. You know, others have. Verse 37, If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that are right unto you are the commandments of the Lord. You know, the emphasis is on what God has said there, not what any individual says, what Steve says or, or whatever. So what we're speaking needs to be the Word of God. Verse 38, but if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Okay, and that the definition, I looked that word up, uh, to be ignorant, it's uh, uh, not to know. 
You know, the, uh, I do not know. I'm ignorant, okay? It's, it's, it, but it, sometimes it has the idea of willful ignorance attached to it, okay? Willful ignorance. Verse 39, Wherefore, brethren, covet, covet to prophesy, proclaim, and forbid not to speak with tongues. Now, folks, you'd never ever forbid the immature or the childish. They're gonna, they're gonna grow. They're gonna come. They're gonna come along. You don't say, you don't say to a child, you know, man, that's childish. You know, stop acting like a child. I mean, you don't do that. You might say that to an adult who is acting like a child, but you don't do that to a child. A child is a child. You know, I mean, actually, we're pretty good at yelling at children to grow up. You know, I mean, think about that, all right? Let all things be done decently and in order, all right, is what the text says. And there's a well of a lot of confusion in a lot of church services that you go to. And it appears that God anticipated that. You know, obviously, He did. He expected that. That's why we're reading that. So that ends the 14th chapter. I can't tell you that I'm not. Uh, I can't tell you that I'm disappointed that we're not still in it. Uh, looking forward to chapter 15, but I'm I'm really eagerly anticipating the Lord's return. As you all know, he, we're still here. He did not uh, return for us on Feast of Trumpets, but uh, we stay the course. I don't think that we can do anything but keep looking up. Look, I love you all. I truly do. Thank you for all your comments, all of your prayers, all of your support. Pray for those in Florida. Pray for all of our brothers and sisters everywhere. Until next time, this is Steve. Thanks for watching.